I can think of no better way to draw uh, our unit on the age of faith in reason to a close than by examining the philosophy of the great Immanuel Kant. But just as Thomas Aquinas can be viewed as the, the pinnacle of uh, medieval philosophy, uh, you can think of Kant as being the pinnacle or the high water mark of the age of uh, enlightenment of modern philosophy. You know, just as Thomas Aquinas pulls together the disparate uh, strands and different traditions and synthesizes them in a very creative way, uh, Immanuel Kant does the same thing with respect to his modern forebears. So what I want to do to make our way into Kant's philosophy is to uh, give you the sort of immediate backdrop beginning with uh, the 16th century philosopher René Descartes. So remember, this is at the, the beginning of the scientific revolution. 1500s, you see the emergence of the new science of mechanism and the displacement of the old Aristotelian science. And this brought with it a kind of a, a, a philosophical crisis because Aristotle's science uh, was wedded together with Aristotle's metaphysics. His metaphysics were first philosophy. His general way of viewing the world was, was tailor-made for his science. Once his science is, is seen to be um, falling apart, is, is, is being replaced with the new uh, Newtonian mechanistic science, um, the question then becomes, how can we formulate a new metaphysics to displace the Aristotelian metaphysics and to secure or to support the new science? So this is the, the project that uh, Descartes engages in, in the meditations and, and in other works. His attempt, really, is to become the new Aristotle, to develop and to deliver a new metaphysics that's going to support the new science and as well to develop a new philosophical methodology which would lead to certainty and objective knowledge. Now, you know, through time, the other rationalist philosophers who followed Descartes uh, also used this kind of uh, Cartesian method and had many of the same aims. You know, in addition to wanting to bolster and support the new science, many of them also wanted to reconcile the new science with certain beliefs that uh, seem to be uh, jeopardized by the new science. Ancient beliefs in you know, the existence of God, the freedom and rationality of the human person, the immortality of the soul, and so forth. So Descartes um, and his followers take up this new philosophical methodology, which is supposed to provide a foundation for the new science and reconcile it with these age-old beliefs. The crisis that starts emerging towards the end of the modern period follows on the heels of a kind of recognition that the project um, isn't working out as well as uh, it, it was hoped uh, by these rationalistic philosophers. I mean, one of the embarrassing things about it is that these philosophers engaged in the same kind of philosophical method, they used the same method, which was supposed to lead to objective knowledge, certainty, to a disclosure of the real nature of the world and so forth. And again and again, they kept on disagreeing with one another, coming up with very different metaphysics, different outlooks, using this same method, which is supposed to lead to a sort of geometrical certainty, to mathematical certainty. Um, in addition to that, um, the, uh, the disagreements led to a kind of new movement, which we came across in the philosophy of Locke and Hume, a movement which was empiricist in its outlook, in its orientation, rather than rationalistic. Remember, Locke says, no, we don't have these innate ideas that allow us to sort of penetrate into the depths of nature and to, to see the world and, and all things as they truly are. Rather, he, he limits what we can know. He limits uh, the, the scope of, of human knowledge um, by saying that rather than possessing innate concepts, innate ideas, all that we can know about the world or even think coherently about the world or about anything else comes to us from sense experience, comes to us through the senses. Now you'll recall that Locke himself is still a pretty conservative philosopher in the sense that he too believes in God, believes in life after death, believes in freedom in a, in a certain compatibilistic sense of freedom and so forth. 
when we get to Hume, there's a greater and greater degree of uh, suspicion that uh, the ability of the human mind to come to knowledge of things like God, of things like the afterlife, um, is, uh, is it, it's not as uh, optimistic as the way that the earlier philosophers had viewed it. In fact, uh, there's a greater degree of skepticism concerning not only, you know, the fundamental metaphysics and the, the nature of reality and so forth. But with Hume, what you begin to see is a skepticism about even our ordinary knowledge claims, even common claims, concerning what we can know about the future, say, that it's going to be in conformity with the past, that the same laws of nature will continue to govern uh, things just as they have always done. That fundamental principle that grounds our causal reasoning and our inductive logic and so forth comes under scrutiny in Hume's philosophy. Um, and, and reason itself, the ability of the mind to know anything other than its own contents, its own immediate contents, uh, becomes uh, more and more narrow in its scope in terms of what it can know. Now, because of this, you see a, a really very interesting track through, from Descartes through Hume, and it's a sort of a downward track in a way. It begins with this great estimation, this positive evaluation of the uh, ability of the human mind to penetrate into reality and to know things with certainty, to know things objectively. And it ends with a kind of skeptical pessimism with respect to what we can know. In fact, Hume had such a pronounced influence at the end of the, the modern period when Kant begins to emerge that it, it, it's really owing to David Hume in some ways that, that we receive the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Kant memorably says that it's David Hume who uh, awoke him from his dogmatic slumber. It was this challenge skeptical challenge raised by Hume and the sort of crisis of the Enlightenment raised by all of the disagreements and, and the, uh, the lack of certainty and so forth that, uh, that is the immediate challenge that Immanuel Kant faces. So it's in this framework that we need to understand um, his, his philosophical mission and his work. So what does Kant say with respect to Hume's skeptical challenge? Remember Hume had said we can't know not only things about the future that we commonly think that we can predict about the future, but we, we have to remain skeptical even about the existence of ordinary objects in the external world. Kant says, no, this is a deep problem. In fact, he says it's one of the greatest scandals of philosophy that nobody's been able to prove the existence of the external world. You know, perhaps we're all just trapped in a realm of ideas with nothing substantial underlying them. So Kant wants to address this concern, solve this problem, set philosophy on a secure footing. And because of this, you can see him as having very conservative aims, right? Um, at the same time, the means that he deploys in order to attain this aim or these, these conservative goals are fairly radical means. He undergoes what he himself calls a kind of Copernican revolution in philosophy. So remember Copernicus um, had uh, revolutionized astronomy by saying that, you know, look, instead of, of uh, seeing the solar system as geocentric, we need to see it as heliocentric. So the sun is the center of the solar system and we orbit around it. And that, you know, forces us to rethink our position in the solar system and forces us to recognize that the phenomena which look geocentric also look heliocentric, right? If you put on those lenses instead. Okay, well, in what respect is Kant's philosophical revolution Copernican in its nature? Well, you can think of the traditional um, aim of metaphysics as being the attempt to get to know what reality is really like in itself. We've got appearances, we've got the way things seem to us, the way that we perceive things, the way we conceptualize, cognize things, and then there's the things themselves. The question is always, well, 
are our representations of reality accurately displaying or representing uh, what they seem to be representing? Do, do, they, do our appearances, representations match up with the way that reality is in itself? Kant says, you know, we need to think about the task of philosophy somewhat differently now. Instead of thinking of the world items in the world as existing out there objectively in themselves and then wondering about the way that they appear to us, the extent to which they match up with the appearances. Rather, we should think of the items of empirical experience as being in part constructed by our appearances. So what Kant says is you know, when it comes to the thing in itself, if we ask the question, what is the thing in itself like? What's reality in itself like? Well, we're, what we're really asking is the question, what is reality uncognized like? But, of course, any attempt to say what it's like will involve you in the very act of cognizing it, right? I mean, in order to think about something, you filter it through your conceptual scheme, your categories of thought. Now, we can have trust, we can be sure that the future is going to be conformable to the past with respect to the categories of causation, space, time, and all of those, but we can do it, here's the price tag, only if we consider those objects in the phenomenal or empirical world as being in part constituted by our own conceptual categories of space, of time, of causation. So this leads to a kind of constructive anti-realism on Kant's part, you know, you yourself, by way of experiencing and conceptualizing the items in your perceptual field, form, in part, constitute, in part, what those items are, okay? So the items in your phenomenal experience are items of which you can have some degree of certainty because you yourself cause them, in part, to be the kinds of things that they are. Items outside or distinct from the phenomenal objects of your experience, Kant calls noumenal objects. These are things that exist in themselves, but they're not objects of knowledge for us. So this is going to sound somewhat similar to, to Plato's kind of dualistic theory of reality, where you've got the realm of the forms and you've got, you know, the, the world of sense perception. The difference is Kant doesn't think we've got any a priori epistemic access to the realm of the forms. And he's not thinking of noumena as being forms in Plato's sense anyway. Noumenal objects are things as they exist in themselves. And they exist in a, a different realm or they're a different aspect of reality, one to which we have no access. When it comes to the uh, empirical knowledge we possess of the world, that can be on a sure footing. But again, the price tag, the, the way that it can be uh, an, an item of knowledge and of certainty for us, is only because we ourselves end up constructing the world of our experience.